Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth on Now You Know. We're brought to you by abetterrootplanner.com. Use our link in the show notes below to get a 30-day free trial to the premium app. You can help support our channel by heading over to ecoware.us to find all sorts of new designs every week. We carbon offset the production, shipping, and life cycle of every product, and we plant 10 trees for every order. And we're also brought to you by bigbattery.com. No matter what you need to power, Big Battery can provide you with the latest battery tech at the best price per kilowatt hour, guaranteed. Their batteries are easily installed, require zero maintenance, and they're made right here in the U.S. Pick up yours today at BigBattery.com and use the code now you know for 5% off at checkout. This week's episode is sponsored by Omaze. How would you like to win an all-electric Audi e-tron Sportback and $20,000 cash? Yeah, not only could you win this sporty 400-horsepower electric SUV, but you can also score two VIP tickets to attend the Lumineers concert in Denver, Colorado as an added bonus. And yes, the flights and hotel are included. Now, the Audi e-tron has some really cool stats. With dual electric motors, you can get 0 to 60 in 5.5 seconds, top speed of 124 miles an hour, and with the 95 kilowatt hour battery, a range of 218 miles. Yeah, and the 21-inch turbine-style wheels, Bang & Olfensen 3D premium sound system, panoramic roof, and heads-up display. To potentially win the Audi e-tron Sportback, $20,000 in cash, and the VIP concert experience, go to amaze.com slash NYK Audi. And speaking of concerts, you will be supporting this great cause, Reverb, which harnesses the power of music to inspire and empower millions of individuals to take action for people in the planet. Reverb partners with musicians, festivals, and venues to green their concerts. So far, they've eliminated over 3 million single-use plastic water bottles at concerts, supporting 2,000 family farmers, elevating the work of 4,000 local and national nonprofits, and eliminating over 180,000 tons of CO2. Congratulations to recent Omaze winner Linda from Madison, Alabama, who won a Tesla Model 3 and $20,000 in cash. So to enter for your chance to win the Audi e-tron Sportback, $20,000 in cash, and the VIP concert experience, and support a great charity, go to amaze.com slash NYK Audi. All right, so coming up is a fascinating conversation we had with Tom Zaki, the founder and CEO of TerraCycle and Loop. I don't think there's anything that we need to talk about beforehand. I think we just get straight into it. Yeah, I'm so fortunate today to have with us Tom Zaki. He's the CEO and founder of Loop and of TerraCycle. These are two companies that we've been following for a long time. And I've got tons of questions for Tom because I've actually used both his products. So um, yeah, I just want to jump right in. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thanks for having me. Real pleasure. Well, I guess I'd love to jump in first on TerraCycle. Um, that's, I think, the company you started first. Um, yes. Can you tell us what TerraCycle is and what you guys are up to today? Yeah, absolutely. So in its core, TerraCycle is a waste management company. Uh, we've been around for 20 years now, national in 20 countries. And uh, what we try to do is uh, really two things. First, and what you probably, uh, what most people may know us for is help recycle those things you can't locally recycle. And so we have recycling programs for everything from cigarette butts to dirty diapers and hundreds and hundreds of other waste streams all over the world. And then the second thing we do is try to help companies integrate waste into their products. So they're making their products from unique uh, forms of recycled waste. So everything from ocean plastic to rock and roll festival waste to even the garbage on the top of Mount Everest, uh, just to name a few examples. So that's basically what TerraCycle is all about. I guess I'm going to date myself a little bit here. When we used to collect stuff in the schools in my town and at the farmer's market, a lot of things I remember that we would kind of uh, tell the public about was we would take things that were really hard to recycle and no one would take things like juice pouches, which I, I'm dating myself because they're not that popular anymore. <laughs> um, and that those could be made into like we had some juice pouch bags, I remember, that we'd show people. Um I think where a lot of people get stuck and I get stuck is when you look at like a toothpaste um, tube or you look at like you're talking about a dirty diaper. It's like, come on, you're not really recycling this. Um, can you tell us like give us some examples like, yeah, what do you do when you get those boxes full of stuff that can't be recycled? Totally. Well, why don't we do this? You give me a waste stream and I'll tell you what we do. Okay. okay well, dirty diapers. <laughs> just, I can't believe you do anything with dirty diapers. What, what? Dirty diapers. Okay. <laughs> so each type of garbage, I'll give you the preface once and then we'll go a bit more rapid fire, but each type of garbage is like a unique animal, uh, but it is an animal nevertheless. It's a type of garbage. And the two, really three questions that have to be solved to make something like a dirty diaper uh, become recyclable is how do we collect it? How do we process it? And then actually the most important part is how do we construct a business model where someone's going to fund it, right? And actually pay for it. So 
Let's talk Dirty Diaper. So Dirty Diaper Recycling is now live in Amsterdam. Uh, we've been running it there for a few years, and actually it's now growing. It's going to be launching soon in Japan and in France, uh, not yet in the U.S. Um, the collection, I mean, it's literally a show, right? So we have to have uh, um, these smart bins, you know, that are very much smell control. Because you can imagine if uh, wherever you put them at a retailer, at a nursery, and think hot summer, you know, like everything that can make something festy. Um, we really put a lot of innovation into making sure that you could walk by it and never know it was there. We have a special bin that we, you know, that, that we ask consumers to put any brand of diaper into. And then we service those and it goes over to a facility where now diapers, we always look at, can it be reused? Dirty diapers, not really. Can it be upcycled? That's like the example you gave of the uh, juice pouches into backpacks. Not really. So we then, uh, the bottom would be recycling where we look at how do we rip it apart and take apart all the materials. So diapers first go through a sterilization process. Then from there, they get shredded and separated into what it's made from. So diapers are made from cellulosic materials, like the fluffy stuff. Uh, you also got this crystal inside called SAP or superabsorbent polymer that absorbs the urine basically. And it's like those crystals that when you put liquid to it, get very big. And then there's basically plastics. All the sheetings are polypropylene or other forms of plastic. And when you shred it, you can separate those things and reconstitute each, not necessarily to make a new diaper, but those crystals are really good in the agriculture industry, you know, to hold water, right? Uh, especially in uh, more uh, areas that are a bit more arid. Um, the cellulosic material can be made into new cellulosic material and the plastics can be recycled into like rigid uh, plastic products. And net net, that's diaper recycling. And then I, I mentioned the third and important part is in that example, Pampers is who funds the bill. And they're doing it, hoping that you may prefer their brand over the competition because they're offering diaper recycling. There's a bit more logic to it, but that's the simplification. I Okay, so this is making sense to me that if I'm a plastics manufacturer or a company like Pampers and I can put on my box, you know, can be recycled through TerraCycle, you know, more customers are going to want to come to me. Exactly. And then, you know, we do have to really... Uh, 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 help the brands, you know, think about how to bring that to life because the more they see value, the more they're going to grow it all over the world. And this is the trick to sustainability if you're impregnating sustainability into business is the more you let the business know how it's going to drive traditional points of value, right? Like increased market share, you know, uh, whatever it may be, that's what's going to then make them be like, wow, I'm not doing this because I'm like protecting against the risk but I can lead with it. And instead of doing marketing dollars, I can you know do it here. And that's how the platforms really uh, fundamentally grow. So instead of there being like a diaper, diaper tax, tax, and we're going to tax, tax every, every diaper, diaper that, that gets, gets sold, sold, and it's going to put it into a diaper recycling fund or something like that, then you'd have businesses basically trying to get around it. So it'd be like, oh, these aren't diapers. These are natty packs. <laughs> and they're for your little munchkins. They're munchkin holders, you know? And then it's like, okay, so they're trying to get around it, or they're trying to get out of it, or um, it'll be very unpopular. And people will be like, the diaper tax is going to make diapers more expensive for everybody. And well, that's uh, unacceptable. So you're kind of circumnavigating all of those problems that when we try and like solve them through government, which is where you kind of think like, hey, this is the government. We solve problems that normally businesses don't solve because profit drives everything. And if if we don't have to deal with dirty diapers, then that's great. We can just wash our hands of that and you just put it in the trash and whatever. Instead, you're flipping it on its head and saying like, oh, I might actually want to buy the diapers if I know that you're, you're appealing to the, the consumer uh, to do the right thing. Right. Yeah. And I think all these factors come into play, right? It's, it's not like one or the other. So, for example, America is not great at legislating waste solutions. In fact, in, you know, you could say a lot of the things about America where it's the only wealthy country that doesn't, right? And fill in the blank, like healthcare and, and, and other things. But it's also the only developed country that doesn't have what's called extended product responsibility taxes. So everywhere else, if you make a package, you have to do what you just described and pay a tax. Uh, and that money is used to help boost recycling rates. An important backdrop here, just to sort of, you know, jump on this, if I may, is that what makes something recyclable is not whether it can be, right? That's what we usually think. It's like recyclers are recycling what they can. And if the stuff that you can't recycle, it's not, it's because it can't be. There's some technical wizardry issue. It's the recyclers are not in the business of that. They're in the business of extracting from your waste what is valuable and selling it. And what is not valuable, they won't bother. It's urban mining, right? So when you put something in the recycling bin, what happens? A garbage company picks it up and they take it to a thing called a MRF, which is like basically a sorting center. And it gets on a conveyor belt and either robots or people, usually people, sort out the stuff they can sell at a profit. 
And that then actually goes to what you would call a recycler who melts it down and makes it into something new. But it's really mining for value, right? And what makes that diaper or chewing gum or razor blade or, I mean, you know, list off most objects in the world, not recyclable, is simply the opposite. It costs more to collect and process and the results are worth. And so we somehow have to tease out whether in countries like Europe, maybe through legislation, in countries like America, maybe more voluntarily, someone who would happily say, I'm going to pay for that. I see. So the example that I gave you, the reason I gave you that example is because I'm American. And so when I think of like, oh, well, we could pass that legislation. My first thought is that that'll never pass. That'll never go through. It'll, right. Okay. But if I but you're, stay with the American, Americans are great capitalists. If you're a retailer, right, and I can tell you, hey, if you run recycling for, let's say you're a cosmetic boutique for cosmetics, and that gets people into your store, you may be like, wow, I can drive foot traffic through recycling maybe better than if I can uh, run a TV commercial or run a coupon, something that actually doesn't even make the world any better, just, you know, is straight marketing, right? And so for me, whatever tools I can lever, whatever I can sort of put on the table, the more I can do, the bigger these recycling programs become. It sounds to me like now, after doing this for decades, or like right, you're in your second decade of doing this, it must, you've learned some tricks, I'm sure. And it's probably a little easier when you approach a company, you know, Procter & Gamble or some big company, and you're like, let's do this because you can point to all these successes. But what was it like when you first started? Because I know that you got into waste in an unexpected way. Maybe you could talk about your early yeah. years. Yeah, it definitely has been different. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, I mean, that's one of the nice things as you mature as a business, you know, you're, it gets easier to grow, right? So I'm originally from Hungary. I only mentioned that because it was communist when I was born there, right? And uh, I was born in 82, Chernobyl happened, you know, we escaped as refugees, uh, went sort of as, uh, you know, across Europe and then Canada. And then I went down to university in New Jersey, which is where I'm speaking to you from today. I now live here. And uh, I fell in love with entrepreneurship, you know, along the way. I mean, of course, come from communism to capitalism, it's like the best thing ever. It's literally the American dream. And, you know, fast, fast, this route in my eyes to fame and fortune, right? And I remember this sort of moment. Um, the first class I took at Princeton was Econ 101, and the professor gets up on stage and says, what's the purpose of business, right? That's a very appropriate sort of opening question. And the answer she was looking for was maximize profit to shareholders, which is the textbook definition. And I get it. I'm like not anti-profit, but is that, I bet you most people who interact with a company, customers, employees, don't care about that at all. They care about what service is provided or what product, you know, is, is given. And then profit maybe is more accurately an indicator of health, right? If you're profitable, you can flourish and grow. And if you're not, the opposite happens. And so I was sort of thinking about how to create a business. I was just searching for this idea of like a business topic that put purpose first, but did that at a profit so it could flourish and, and grow. And... Um, you know, I fell into this sort of garbage topic. I mean, my friends, uh, this was before pot became a bit more, um, you know, uh, legalized, let's say. And uh, they were growing plants in their basement. They couldn't really make it work. It was up in Montreal. And they called me one day and they said they finally figured it out. So, of course, I get in my car, drive up, you know, uh, from New Jersey. And uh, yes, they were absolutely right. Plants were doing great. We enjoy. had a good night. And then I asked them, like, how did you make it work? And they said, we took organic waste, fed it to worms, took the worm poop and fed it to the plants. And... Like that was awesome. But then it started, you know, getting this idea of garbage in my mind. And like garbage is the strangest topic filled with so many anomalies. So I'll give you just a couple, just to sort of wet the noodle, right? We live in a pretty materialistic world, but isn't it weird that in such a world, everything we own and think literally everything, like the shelves behind you, the floor, you know, on the, you know, not just like the obvious stuff, like a, you know, like a candy wrapper, Everything will be property of a garbage company, with no exception. Everything we possess in a world where our worth is somewhat linked to what we possess, mm. they will own it all. And 99% within the year we purchased it. Wait a minute. Say that again? 99%? 99% of what we buy will be property of a garbage company within the year it was bought. Is that by mass? Is that by item? I've heard that statistic by dollar, by like how you like, like how money is spent. Wow. But I mean, think about it. Most of what we buy are consumables. Yeah. And even the things that we perceive as durables, like clothing, have become consumables. Right. right? Like here's a, a sort of a neat stat on that. Like if you were if we were around 100 years ago, um, it, it, I know it for women, not men, but an average woman, you know, middle income would have bought two apparel items per year and used them for 20 years, uh, you know, before they became rags. Today, wow. 100 years later. 
it's 66 apparel items per year are purchased and worn three times on average before disposal. Everything is moving in that direction, right? Wow. And so, yeah, it's insane. So for me, when you see something like that, when you solve it and it's purposeful, it's a huge playground to play in. And since no one's innovating, the types of things we can do are really fun. I mean, you can, it's, it's like, imagine if like you had the internet and no one else was playing on it. Early years, you figure out that like vermicomposting is awesome. Waste streams are awesome. Yes. But how did you, how did you start a business? Like, how did you get the first company to be like, sure, I'll give you my, uh, I'll take back my juice packs or I'll give you money to, to take my juice packs. Like, how did you, how did you convince them to do that? Right. As you described, we first started as a worm poop company, right? Like I, I dropped out of school and literally what TerraCycle was, was taking organic waste, feeding it to worms, packaging it in used soda bottles and selling it at whatever, Home Depot, right? Like that was our business. Mm -hmm. And we grew, you know, over four years doing that. And then we started thinking, could we make other products out of garbage, right? Like literally juice pouches into backpacks. And so as we started doing that and we were able to get them sold, we had to go find the waste. And that's how we actually sort of invented these national recycling programs was by going to actually the first company ever. I think it was like companies like Cliff Bar and uh, Capri Sun and a few others who said, could we run a collection program so we can help make these products? And then what happened is we realized that we had put the product as the hero of our business. Like, let's make a thing and then find garbage to make it where the product is the hero, right? And, we, and, and as we started learning about, you know, recycling and, and, uh, and, and also what's, you know, what, what's happening and the scale at which it's happening with mm -hmm. consumer product goods, like the immense size of waste is just unbelievable. We realized that we should shift the hero of the equation away from the product to the garbage. So instead of starting with, I want to make a product, and then what garbage can I make? It was, I need to solve this type of garbage, and then what can I make it into? It may seem similar, but it's a fundamental shift and then the whole thing just took off uh, 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 from there um, and has grown into, you know, sort of where we are. Now, at the beginning, you know, it's you got to MacGyver your way into all this and you're like, uh, you know, just barely, uh, uh, you know, able to get the meetings, let alone sort of beg for business. Um, but I'd say the biggest lesson I've learned in working with corporations around this topic, getting them to voluntarily fund, not like you were describing, like have it taxed or legislated, is not to lead with, you should do this because you're polluting the world, right? And you should take responsibility, which is the usual like social business point of view to do it. And honestly, that's what I care about. But instead to say, how do I help you achieve what you're trying to achieve, whatever your business goals are, but show you you can achieve that by doing something purposeful, like running a big recycling program, instead of, um, you know, launching TV commercials that, you know, um, may not necessarily do anything special, just communicate your product. And the more we did that, the more companies said, oh, these guys get what we're trying to achieve. And we'd of course love to do it in a way that makes the world better than in a way that it doesn't move the world forward. And what I love about TerraCycle is that it takes uh, a lot of people to make it work in a community if they want to do one of your programs, but it raises money. So a lot of kids are excited about, you know, hey, kids, gather up this junk or this trash um, and let's recycle it and then they get excited about it and i've seen kids like just come alive and just go pick up throughout their neighborhoods um barrels and barrels of stuff that would have gone into the you know the landfill of the incinerator and now turned it back into you know useful stuff and shout out to jerry and christina uh to the the best people in our community who do that um and it's it's just amazing what you can do to, in a school for instance you know one week the kids are just throwing that stuff in the trash the next week it's like gold you know we've in, as a small company we've donated just under 50 million dollars in these in exactly what you're describing right wow. and i think we need to to enable recycling which is the first step in a sustainable journey like you know before someone may cut out meat may live in a small house you know may do things that are bigger lifestyle changes recycling is where we begin so we've got to do that well and it's not just about making things available but we have to make them fun and we have to get people excited because that actually gets more momentum uh than just saying here's a bin and i hope you use it now let's move on to your second company, Loop. That's another product um, and service that Jesse and I have tried. Um, and so to describe this to, to people who are watching so that you know they know what Loop is. Absolutely. So Loop is a platform for reuse. What it does is uh, it enables consumer product companies to create reusable versions of their products. Think like Tide laundry detergent in reusable stainless steel or your you know ice cream with Haagen-Dazs also in re beautiful reusable packaging. And then you can uh, buy that uh, either in store or online from your favorite retailers like here in the US, Kroger and Walgreens and Ulta Beauty, just to name a few examples, or even Burger King. And uh, uh, you pay a deposit on the package when you get it. 
And then when you return it, not just to the retailer you purchased, but any retailer, you get your money back. And then instead of that package being you know, garbage or even being recycled, it goes to a state-of-the-art cleaning facility where it's cleaned, and then the company refills it and sells it to someone else. It's sort of like how the milkman model worked back in the day, but imagine meeting everything. I mean, literally, you know, almost any consumer product uh, uh, and coming to life in uh, uh, in, in retailers. Um, so that's basically how, how it works. And it, it launched about uh, two and a half years ago and has been on sort of a whirlwind of growth. It's now up in four countries, launching two months from now in Japan and then Australia, and uh, hopefully bringing a very convenient reuse opportunity to folks. So it's easy to play in reusables without having to like wash out your own bottle, take it to a refill station, and also really Get, get the brands, you know, people want and already consume. So, I mean, I think that people are used to uh, deposits, especially yes. in the United States. You know, there's bottle deposits and you can, you know, drive it all the way to, where is it, Maine and get 10 cents, you know, ooh. Um, but usually that's, that's not being reused. It's just being recycled. They're going to take that's it, right. they're going to grind it up, and then they're going to melt it down and turn it into something new. This is a, a de departure from that. And so you're paying a bigger deposit for this item because it's not just like... Uh, oh, I hope this doesn't end up, you know, polluting on the side of the road somewhere. It's like, this is an actually useful item. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of value in it because you can bring it back and, and have it be completely reused. So what was the impetus for this company then? You know, when we were doing the worm poop thing, we asked ourselves, are we fulfilling our mission to eliminate the idea of waste? That's how it always began. It wasn't my aspiration wasn't to create a fertilizer company. It was create a waste solutions company. And we realized no, because we're not making, you know, the, the garbage, the hero. And that's how we did that first shift. We asked ourselves, you know, uh, maybe now five years ago, is recycling the answer to garbage? Because that's what we were doing and, and are still doing in a very big way. And we realized, you know, it's not. It's a solution to the symptom of garbage, but not to the root cause. If we don't have garbage, we don't really need recycling, right? And so then the question became, what is the root cause of garbage? And I would argue garbage was invented in the 1950s uh, when uh, disposable consumption became big. I mean, before that, we cobbled our shoes, we mended our clothes, we bought milk from the milkman, you know, and motor oil and perfume came in reusable packaging. It was a very different world. And it's this idea, I think, of like throwaway society is what created the modern idea of waste. And then all the data backs that up on when garbage just exploded. And so then the question was, okay, how do we shift from a single-use ecosystem to a reusable, but, but in a way that's going to appeal to everyone, not just the super hardcore you know, consumers who are probably already going to package-free stores and doing this sort of thing? Like, How do we get the Walmart shopper right, uh, who buys... Tropicana orange juice and Coke and whatever. And what we realized is that reuse already exists in a big way in the United States. Propane tanks, super reusable. Beer kegs, super reusable. And it's, that's not even appealing to eco people. It's just how those products are. But try to take your propane tank to the beer store or take the beer keg to wherever you got the propane tank and it doesn't work. And that's just two products. And so the basic idea was, if we're going to really scale reuse, we have to solve that, right? We have to make it that you can buy something anywhere and return it anywhere, sort of like your recycling bin, right? Your recycling bin doesn't care where you bought that soda bottle. It just cares that it is a soda bottle. And so once we had that, that was sort of the essence of what we wanted to create as this, as this overall platform. And what got brands really excited about it was it's 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 sort of you know both against the uh, you know solving for the risk but all but much more about innovation because if you're a brand today what's happening your budget for packaging is decreasing every year because you're trying to squeeze costs squeeze costs squeeze costs have you noticed how packaging is always getting sort of thinner and I noticed this by the way on a monopoly board right it's one of my favorite games and um, but if you compare monopoly boards that are made today compared to like 50 years ago have you noticed the pieces are just like thinner you know, not solid, like it's just made, you know, uh, with, 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 with lower value materials. And that's the same in, I mean, absolutely everything. And that's a problem because you can't innovate. You can't really do cool things when every year your budget goes down. But if you shift the package to the point that you had mentioned earlier from being something that the consumer owns to something they borrow, then you can explode the investment in the package because it's now an asset. And that is what got everyone really excited about Loop is not just that it's more sustainable. I mean, absolutely. But they can now do things that they can never do before because they keep getting that package back. And so to your point, the deposit is not in bottle bills, which are good things. The deposit is a motivator to have you recycle more. 
That's its entire function, to get you to collect more and bottle bills do increase recycling rates. But in lieu, the deposit is actually what the package is worth, right? Now you can keep it, it's no problem, but that's what it's worth to the company who, you know, who wants it back. So they don't have to make it again, they can just clean it and, and fill it up. And that was the huge breakthrough, which is why we've seen it, you know, it move so quickly overall. And it's really interesting. I I uh, studied as a plastics engineer. I haven't applied it much, thankfully. Um, but one, I remember one of the lessons was like, okay, so we've learned how to make a bottle out of plastic. Now, how do we make it attractive con to consumers? And it's like, so what you need is you want something that's ideally cold and also shiny because that's what humans like. They like cold, shiny things. Um, wonder why uh you know metals and stuff like that good to have around rocks uh maybe shiny rocks preferably um but the problem was how do you make plastic which is insulative so when you touch it it's warm and it's uh, naturally not that shiny you have to plate it with metal you have to do something to make the person want to buy it so you add some kind of reflective stuff but what you're actually able to do is package these items in glass and stainless steel, both of which are cold to the touch and shiny. And I think that's a really interesting point because when you're trying to reduce costs, I mean, obviously, you know, you wonder why the tequila is in such a fancy bottle. It's because you're not paying actually that much for the tequila. Um, you're paying partially for the bottle. They, they needed to grab you in the store and well, <laughs> you know, that it's a high margin item. So, I mean, I, I assume brands just love being able to pour money into packaging, but does it have to be standardized between all these brands? The, the way we sort of answered this, right? Because there's this natural tension. The more standardized, the lower the cost is, right? It's we can get bigger cleaning equipment that cleans that package at greater scale, lowering the cost. And the less standardized will the exact opposite. But what we've determined here is Loop doesn't have an opinion on standardization. We let the companies decide, just like, frankly, today, disposable packaging has the same thing. Like, have you noticed the aisle of cereal? Everything is a box in a bag. And the only difference between Cheerios and whatever else is the artwork. But then you go over to the perfume aisle and every perfume object is like wildly different. So let the market decide. I mean, the, you know, the, the market knows what consumers want and where differentiation is important. And where it's absolutely not important, like have you noticed motor oil containers all look the same, right? Because clearly, probably it doesn't matter to whoever buys motor oil, but in uh, cosmetics, it really matters. So we, we let the markets decide. And if a company is really asking us, how do we make the costs lower? Well, we're going to recommend be standardized. But if they want to innovate and go into really amazing places, then you do anything you want. But the cost of cleaning that object will go up because the apples to apples comparison between, say, a shampoo bottle, you know, that's in plastic, like single use. And well, here's one. This is say a shampoo bottle. This is Pantene in loop, which is reusable, is in this in the plastic version, whatever the cost of that plastic bottle is 100% in the price of your shampoo. You own it. Ironic, because of course you don't want it. In this one, what goes into the price of the shampoo when they calculate it is your use of this bottle and the cost of cleaning it. Right. And that's your apples to apples, uh, you know, uh, like one to one comparison. And uh, it's amazing to see these different industries go, you know, really in different directions. Um, I'll give you a fun one, though. We're actually launching beer in the UK in Loop with this really cool company called Brewdog. And they're going to put it into a growler. And um, we were running the e e it's a stainless steel, like gorgeous, beautiful growler. And it turns out if you, uh, it's cheaper to buy, it's going to be cheaper to buy with them a whatever it is, a gallon of beer, like good premium beer in a stainless steel growler. It's going to be way cheaper to buy that, even if you keep the growler, than buying the growler empty on Amazon by like 50%. Isn't that wild? Wow. I want to ask you about the cost of cleaning because, um, you know, when we were using this, it really is cool to have your pantry full of stainless steel, you know, a thing of rice in stainless steel. It was just like, never seen that before. Mm -hmm. That That's awesome because normally it's in some bag that's falling over or whatever. So that was awesome. But then I did think about, okay, well, this has to go back to some kind of cleaning plant and like how... You know, is that like a huge cost or is that because it's, you know, so many of these coming back to a big plant that's done efficiently, is it not a big cost? Yes. Right. So what I mean by that is in the short term, like right now, while Loop is still relative to single use packaging, tiny, right? Like really, even though we're working with all these big companies, the relative volume is still small. Um, it is expensive. Now, who's funding it? is not the consumer, it's the brands, you know, it's the retailer and it's us. I mean, we're not making money We're we're investing quite a bit into it. And I could say the same for all these brands and retailers, but at scale, 
it does become very competitive with uh, single-use packaging. Um, and it just requires it to get to that scale, which is what we're really focused on right now. How do we make the volume of it be as big as possible? And you can look at models around the world where it already does exist at scale and functions very well. Like the entire beer industry in Canada is on returnable bottles. The entire beverage industry in Germany is returnable uh, bottles. And so if it can work there, it just it, it's very easy to extrapolate that it can work for you know, your pasta sauce to your, you know, to your rice, you name it. it we just got to get to that really big scale. So the name of the game on Loop is as quickly as possible trying to get the scale of it to go big, which is why we're partnered with like McDonald's and Burger King and all these places in an effort to try to get the volumes to be as high as possible. So what's the end game? I mean, what does going to the grocery store look like in this idea? let's just call it a perfect world um, where everything I buy is in a reusable container. So, I mean, is it like I go to the store one day and I have to buy a bunch of stuff and I have a deposit bill that's like $50 or is it just like I've been living my whole life doing this so it's not that bad because I've just, you know, brought back all of my stuff that I'm going to be buying but full now? Yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly like that, right? So, the end state is that any retailer you walk into, like, I mean, honestly, whether it's a, a bowling alley or a movie theater, all the way to your grocery store or your auto shop, you would be able to, you know, buy whatever products you want now in, in, in a reusable context, right? So in consumables, that's, you know, like take like a, like a, you know, bottle of orange juice, you pay a deposit and then you pay for the juice and then you can take that and drop it off in any other retailer. So it's like really, literally a throwaway experience and then you get your deposit back and, you know, the more you do, you would have a bigger, let's call it deposit float, but you do that once and it just sort of rotates, right? Because you're, you know, you return something, you get money back, you buy something, it moves it up and you have this sort of float of deposit overall, which shouldn't at all in the end really increase your costs, right? Um, in what's really interesting in Loop as well, because we talked a lot about it in, in what we would call consumables, like stuff in a bottle where you consume it and you return to us an empty bottle. We're also in a few months launching reusable diapers in Loop with a big diaper brand here in the US or baby clothing in the UK. Now we talked about like clothing and the whole fast fashion problem. And what's interesting in, let's call it a durable, right? Like not a consumable, but a durable. The way it works in say baby clothing is um, you, when you buy it, you pay a cost to use it let's just say that's five bucks and a deposit to own it. And let's call that 10 bucks, just, you know, made up numbers. So you pay 15, but then when you're done, whenever, you know, your baby grew out of it, or, you know, uh, maybe you gave it to someone else and then their baby grew out of it. Like there's no time limit. When you ever, you return it, you get your deposit back 10 bucks. And then instead of having to make a new garment, we just uh, repair it, clean it and sell it again to someone else. And, that so this can be applied to you know any product where reuse is an opportunity right and those are products that become waste like baby clothing is a good one because babies grow out of their clothing incredibly fast um, where there's an opportunity to improve design because you're moving from a, a a disposable ecosystem to an asset so you can really increase design and where you're trying to solve for waste right so it's not for everything it wouldn't be for Swiss watches right there's no no benefit of reuse there, uh, unless you wanted to rotate through styles, you know, really quickly, perhaps. Um, but it does work as well in these other constructs. And that's the end point. Now, at the beginning, it's sort of like the idea of organic. But instead of picking the fight on, you know, let's call it farming practices, we're picking it on reuse. So in the stores, it's already physically in. It's like a section of the store. Like you walk in and it's like all the loop reusable products are stacked together and you can then, you know, buy your, what all these different things, your spreads and your crackers and your rice and whatever in a section of the store. And if consumers then vote for it, it'll get bigger and bigger. Now we're going to cut it here for this episode of In-Depth, but the full interview with another 30 minutes of riveting and fascinating conversation with Tom is on our Disruptive Investing channel. So you can use the link down below to pick up where you left off over on that full interview. Um, we didn't cut anywhere else. So you're basically starting halfway through the episode. Also, if you just click over there by yourself on the Disruptive Investing channel. We'll put a timestamp where you can start exactly where you left off here so you're not wasting any time. Now, if you haven't heard about our Disruptive Investing channel before, we have dozens of videos with some of the smartest, most disruptive minds in the world, like Donald Sadaway from Ambry, George Hotz from Kama AI, and Rebecca Dibsimkin from Octopus Energy, just to name a few. 
On Disruptive Investing, you can get a deep dive with people on topics that are mind melting. You can see the world in new ways, disruptive ways. And we all know that when you disrupt an industry, you potentially can make a lot of money. So go check it out. Thank you so much to Tom Zaki for joining us and doing the amazing work that he's doing to make the planet a better place. And thank you for watching, liking, subscribing, and don't forget to become a member of our Patreon, which supports this show and makes all of this possible. We'll see you next week. Now you know.